Hello and welcome back to the UK edition. We are here at the Nehru Centre in London that is hosting this exhibition on cricketing ties between India and England going back a century and more. It was timed around the Champions Trophy which as we know didn't end quite well for India. There's something about an India-Pakistan match isn't there? What is it? Let's see. Ashish first big conspiracy theory. A lot of people are saying that India lost the match deliberately because of some betting. Seems unlikely to what do you think? No, it's completely unlikely. It has certainly not happened. One day cricket, uh, limited overs cricket in general, is a sport of great uncertainties. The better team on the day won. And then they won for one reason alone. They had nothing to lose. They played fearlessly. Whereas India were under a lot of pressure. They were firm favourites to win. They were on paper the better side. But on that day, they underperformed. But the paper business means very little. On paper, Pakistan was never going to beat England. So these predictions don't count for a lot. The paper business is not going to count for a lot. The paper business is not going to count for a lot. The paper business is not going to count for a lot. The paper business is not going to count for a lot. The paper business is not going to count for a lot. The paper business is not going to count for a lot. The paper business is not going to count for a lot. The paper business is not going to count for a lot. The paper business is not going to count for a lot. The paper business is not going to count for a lot. The paper business is not going to count for a lot. The paper business is not going to count for a lot. The paper business is not going to count in cricket, sometimes it happens that your bowling strength, it doesn't happen always in one day cricket or in 2020 cricket, but it can happen that a better bowling side prevails. And this is what happened both in the semi final against England and in the final against India. Their boat bowling was simply superior. We have this, you know, position of Indian players as dimming robots in India. Does that almost work against them? I think uh, there is a bit of pressure because you are favourites. But I don't think money really comes into the picture. I think adulation can be controlled, but in India we have a form of idol worship and, and therefore that uh, doesn't help uh, matters. Yeah, well, you know, the Indian team, well, we're talking about the great bowling attack of Pakistan, but India's batsmen were this celebrated lineup. That collapse, uh, wasn't that a bit surprising? I think it was really that spell by Amir that won the match uh, for Pakistan. He bowled a brilliant delivery to Rohit Sharma. The ball swung in and trapped him LBW. It was a superb delivery. Then I felt that uh, Virat Kohli could have avoided hitting the ball towards the onside, which is what he did. He played across the line and he was caught at point. So that was avoidable. And as far as the rest is concerned, you look at uh, the dismissal of Shekhar Dhawan. He doesn't move his feet often, and he didn't on this occasion either. Although in the rest of the tournament, he had played extremely well. But on that occasion, when it was an absolutely straight delivery, the ball didn't do a thing but uh, he didn't move his feet and he was caught behind. So those three crucial wickets at the top, I think, uh, made a lot of difference. But you know, we have had issues behind the field, pressing the issues. We saw Kumbhre's letter in which he referred to, you know, uh, issues with Kohli that were publicly denied earlier as they needed to be. But clearly there were issues. They played their part in the world. There was definitely an undercurrent of tension in the Indian dressing room before the match, during the tournament. Uh, so that's something which people knew of. People were trying to paper over the cracks. They failed to do so. And the split has taken place. Having said that, I think it needs to be emphasized that whether it's a player, a captain, or a coach, they are all appointed at the pleasure of the Board of Control for Cricket in India. And therefore, None of those three elements should dictate to the board as to whether the other person should be in the squad or in the think tank or not. Now, in this case, of course, it appears, we don't know the full details, but judging by the statement which was given by the board to Kumle, it appears that uh, the captain, Virat Kohli, was not entirely satisfied he had reservations and therefore the coach had to go right so the coach has now gone to what extent was the coach responsible for this debacle i think uh, the entire indian squad were responsible for the debacle in the final because uh, what happens is that uh, it's a team game 
you have 11 players, you've gone onto the field, you bowl a no ball at a crucial stage when a batsman is three and then he goes on to get a blistering hundred. So that's uh, point number one. Then in general, the Indian bowling looked as if it didn't have penetration. The spinners were hit all over the place. The only redeeming feature about the Indian bowling was Bhuvaneshwar Kumar. The rest simply did not perform. They did not turn up. When it came to the batting, once the top order collapses, it's very difficult for the middle order to rescue a situation. When you're fa facing a scoreboard pressure of 338, so it was a tall score to chase down in any case. The Indian batting certainly had it in them to chase it down. But once you lose your top order, your top batsman, you've had it. Thanks Ashish for talking to us and of course we are waiting to see India win the next time in the right spirit. Thank you. From yoga these days you do want to move to other fields where India triumphs. And India had a field day at Trafalgar Square celebrating International Yoga Day and also earlier at Alexandra Palace and London Eye. Let's find our way to Trafalgar Square. Antar Rashtriya Yoga Divas Par Vishwa Bharke Yoga Premium Ko Anek Anek Shubh Kamanai. It was a hot summer's day for yoga, almost too hot. But yoga enthusiasts turned up at Trafalgar Square this week for International Yoga Day celebrations that in fact lasted all week. Yoga was celebrated earlier at the iconic London Eye. The location was picked following a government directive that yoga should be stamped on all prominent locations around the world. In London, still recovering from a series of tragedies, yoga could have new relevance. It says a lot for what's been happening in the last three years. What happened three years ago has caught the imagination of people here. For the last two years, we had the Yoga International Yoga Day in very different places. But this year, the City of London, the Mayor of London has participated with us to hold it at the Trafalgar Square. Because the City of London has understood that yoga has many benefits for a city. Not only just in health and wellness, but in the manner in which a city is perceived. As being something which uh, gives attention to wellness, to health, to well-being and we call it Yoga for Peace, which is in this time of what is happening in London, a big message that we want to send to the people. People coming from all around the world in London, which is the best place to be our yoga, which is very international, bringing all the communities together. And yoga is bringing the health awareness around the world. And this is a good city around the world, which tourists come from all over the world. Yoga is fantastic. I actually do yoga in Brent, where, which, where I'm a counsellor. And I'm grateful for the, uh, for the High Commission to put on this event because it shows that yoga is not just about exercise, it's about your body and your soul. And thank the Commission very much for putting on this event. Some of the most enthusiastic yoga practitioners so turned out to be the toes. young, and among so the young, the, the children. The and so what have you been doing here today? What did you do? We went on stage! Right? Did and did what? We did the Surya Namaskar. Right, Surya Namaskar. And have you been doing Surya Namaskar for a while? Uh, yes. Yeah. How long have you done it for? Quite a long time. Uh, I, don't, I don't really know. What does Surya Namaskar do for you? What is it? Um, it, gives it gives you harmony and peace. Um, what does it do for you, did you say? It's, it's, it's like sun sanitation. So, so you do it. If the sun's over there, so you do it where the sun is. And it gives you what? What does it do for you? It gives you peace and harmony and it relaxes yeah. you. You looking for peace and harmony in your life? Yes. Yes. It says on our It's like if you get if you get angry, like you should just do a certain mask or you should just breathe. Oh right. And it says on the That's an excellent idea. I must learn from you. Yoga here on Trafalgar Square in the heart of London, under the unsuspecting nose of Lord Nelson up there on his column. Who would have thought yoga would spread like this in Britain this far? It's now a household name, if not household practice yet, but it's catching on. People are discovering and rediscovering the natural way to good health. The energy. The Indian government plans to make Trafalgar yoga Square practice more than some annual celebration. We hope to try and continue this uh, uh, celebrating yoga throughout the year, perhaps not in the iconic fashion that we are doing here 
today. But obviously, this really proves that yoga, yoga is something that the whole world cherishes. It's not just, it's India's gift to humanity, but it's something that is celebrated throughout the world. It brings peace, it brings harmony, it ensures spiritual, mental and physical well-being. It, is, it goes without saying that International Yoga Day, we, we Indian, we are proud about it. Actually, eventually, people realize that this yoga is come from India and this is a celebration of the, you know, the Indian culture. And Indian culture is not only for the culture only, but it's a health conscious people we are. It is very important. It, it, it reflects the culture, the Hindu culture, in it all. So it is very important. The whole world is celebrating and it's a magic which our Prime Minister has done. It is uh, very important and main thing is it is we are the Hindu culture one. We are giving to whole world the benefits of the yoga. We are demonstrating to the whole world and our government has said now it should be across the globe. That is how they are promoting and we are supporting them and today I came here just to support the international yoga event. But the yoga celebrations had a political yes, message uh, too. Soft power at its best. You've seen soft power that the US wheels, you've seen soft power of Hollywood. Now you're seeing India coming out as a soft power giant. Bollywood, Indian food, cinema, dance, music and now yoga. And soon it will get into the other traditional sciences. So we are really looking at a huge impact of the soft power of India on the world. And this is something which I'm really excited about. With Sanjay Suri in London, Maha Siddhiti, News 18. And from Trafalgar Square, let's move to a couple of other squares in London. Maybe one day even move into them. And just how? Let's see after a very short break. Welcome back. So those squares that we were talking about, Grosvenor Square, Lincoln Square, huge fancy housing developments coming up in both the squares and done by the Lodhas of India. Let's see what those could look like and speak with Abhishek Lodha. From a million pounds for a studio flat to something like 30 million pounds for a three bed flat that might look something like this. You could own a place at the new Loda development at Lincoln Square, which is the legal heart of London, which is in the heart of London. Now this flat looks grand, but you could do it the way you want, they'll do it for you. There's all of London waiting just outside the window, just outside the door to step out to. But you might not want to step out because there's so much within the development itself. So this is what the Lincoln Square development will look like. As you can see, it looks bright and not just because the model has been lit up by these lights because you have this square also within with a garden right there so that all the flats will have natural lighting from all sides you have a rooftop garden here you have rooftop solar panels to top of the power supply and when you don't want to step out into London as we were saying there is this and this is a swimming pool right here next to the gym we have a sauna a steam room name it private dining space for residents and a lounge for all who live there and a cinema hall as well. You name it, you have it. What do you want to go out and do in London outside? Abhishek, so one Grosvenor Square, as iconic as it gets, was the American Embassy, then the Canadian High Commission. Iconic building. Now it's going to be your set of flats. What's it going to look like? As you rightly said, uh, number one Grosvenor Square is probably the most uh, iconic building and address uh, in London and beating the, one of the world's most prestigious addresses. Uh, the development in the 30s and 40s, the building used to be the, uh, the American Embassy, the Kennedy stayed there. 
in the uh, Canadian High Commission. They even to date have a replica of the Oval Office in there. Uh, we very carefully married the old and the new. The building's been taken down brick by brick. Each brick has been numbered, and this the the facade on Grosvenor Square is going to be put back exactly as it was with some enhancements. But you see that you know that's a very careful preservation of a very historically important building. Equally, the oval room which was inside the ambassador's residence is going to get recreated inside the building. So you know these are sort of the some of the things while we do uh, what we think are the finest uh, uh, residential lateral apartments uh, in in the world and have the best level of amenities and services but also having this angle of history preserved everything you know really makes this truly unique blend uh, uh, which will offer a lifestyle beyond compare at this development how has the business model worked for you you bought that property for something like half a billion dollars and there's the cost of the development uh, what will be the pricing structure for the property in there so the development, of course, is located in, uh, like I said, the best address in London, and prices are reflective of that. Um, there are about 44 units, including some penthouses, uh, one penthouse and uh, a few townhouses, um, and the prices vary between 7.5 million for the smallest units to over 50 million for the uh, biggest, and I'm talking about in pounds, sterling uh, in sterling. Uh, the cost, we bought the land for 306 million pounds, uh, which is rightly said about 500 million dollars into at the start of 2014. Uh, and uh, the way the development has gone so far, we are pleased uh, with it. The returns look attractive and we are hopeful that as we develop with the project over the next two, two and a half years, uh, we will deliver uh, very strong returns for our uh, stakeholders. And what took you to Lincoln Square? Uh, Lincoln Square is our second development in London uh, that actually is ahead of Grosvenor Square in terms of schedule and will be completing next year. Even in sales, it's done remarkably well. We've sold over 130 million pounds uh, of residences over there in the last nine to ten months after Brexit, which is probably the most successful development in central London amongst all. And it shows you uh, about the resilience of the London market and especially good location, good quality. Uh, that development was formerly an office building. And now we're building uh, this really uh, amazing um, uh, residential development of four separate wings with its own private uh, garden court and a full floor of amenities designed by Patricia Urquiola, which is who is Europe's number one designer currently. Uh, and you know, they're really, it's located in this amazing part of London, very close to Covent Garden, but equally close to the Royal Courts of Justice and then Chancery Lane. Uh, and uh, probably one of the, the most unique locations uh, that London has and something with the, with the LSE, King's College, uh, so education, culture, history, all of it coming together at a great location. Yeah. So anyone in there is likely to have a fair number of lawyers as neighbours? Yes, I think it, it's a location where which has uh, the Lincoln's Inn Field, which is one of the oldest of the four chambers of laws that the Royal Courts of Justice have. Uh, and yes, a lot of lawyers and people in the legal profession are actually already buying over there, and of course they'll be working close by. And what's the pricing structure there? So Lincoln Square uh, uh, is starts off at about a million uh, a million pounds, and then it goes up. Most of the units are below three million, and there are of course some penthouses and bigger units which go up to five six million. You said that there has been strong interest in this post-Brexit. Are you suggesting and are you finding that Brexit might turn out to be good for business, good for the property market? I think certainly uh, the, uh, the impact of Brexit has not been uh, what people were expecting when Brexit happened. I mean, everybody thought gloom and doom and disaster. No, it's not been that. I think in every sector of the economy, including for quality real estate, it's been better than before. I think the devaluation of the sterling has helped because that's increased international buyer interest. And I think if you look out in the medium term, if you look out beyond three, four, five years, because when people buy, international people buy property in London, they're doing it for generations. They're not buying it to buy today and sell after two years. And people recognize the fact that London's attractiveness has been there for 400 years. It's not going to change overnight and it's not going to reduce. And it continues to be one of the world's most important cities and will be. Uh, different reasons will drive it, but people don't only really come over here because it's a financial services capital. They come here for education, they come here for, uh, for legal services and other professional services, they come here for health, they come here for a greater quality of life, the, the streets, the shops, the restaurants, and all of that is going to be there, Brexit or no Brexit. So with the cheaper sterling, uh, London looks definitely more attractive. 
Do you expect a lot of the buyers to be foreigners? We think there's a good mix because of our developments being very, very grounded in the local reality. If you, uh, over time, as you see, Lincoln Square is very different from Grosvenor Square and vice versa because we are very cognizant of London and the fact that it's made up of a number of smaller villages almost and every village has its own character and personality. So uh, the, bu the buying interest is local and foreign. At the early stages of every development, the interest is led by the foreigners and as the development approach approaches completion, uh, the local interest picks up. We were talking about what led you to Lincoln Square. Let's take a step back. What brought the Lodas to London for a start? Uh, so, uh, you know, Loda is the number one developer in India and has been for the last five years. And as a company, uh, we were looking for growth uh, and we wanted to enter into a big market where we could be, you know, sizable. Uh, and we didn't find that opportunity in too many other places. So London was attractive because it has a uh, structural undersupply in housing. And it's a market which is very large size. There is a good local economy. There is international interest. And uh, we are in the process of building up, uh, you know, a strong and meaningful size business here. Will it be Britain or will you look beyond Britain? Right now our focus is on the UK in addition to, of course, our home business in India. Will your developments be environment friendly? Oh, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, our developments are very, very focused on being sustainable. We have a great deal of thought given to, uh, you know, making sure that the resources are optimally used. Uh, there is a significant amount of, uh, of reuse of the various resources, including energy, energy generation, wastewater treatment, and, and so forth. And uh, throughout all our developments at LODA, we pay a very, we pay a very significant focus on sustainability. Finally, and presumably, Lincoln Square will not be the last of your developments in London or in the UK? No, we think that this is a good market. Uh, as I said, you know, the last 8 to 10 months uh, post-Brexit were probably the most challenging time for the property market and in spite of that, our developments have done well, which gives us confidence about the resilience of this marketplace. Uh, we are focused on these two developments currently, but as these developments mature, I'm sure we'll do more. Abhishek, all this looks good and we'll look out for more. Thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. So if you're thinking of moving house, you might know where to look. But that's it for now. Stay cool and see you soon.